nursing and rehab, including activities, exercise, live music, even a pool and wine cellar. Redefining senior living, the Palazzo. When an artist learns his father has Alzheimer's, he decides to preserve their love in a magical play. The two celebrate life and confront mortality before their memories are lost forever. Our Time Machine. All new tonight at 9 on Arizona PBS. Thanks for watching Arizona PBS, a viewer supported community service of Arizona State University. Arizona PBS deeply appreciates every gift we receive, and we are proud to honor our Executive Society. These supporters believe in the mission of public television and are making a real impact in our community. If you would like to join the Executive Society, please call the number below or log on to azpbs.org to join. Thank you. Support for Arizona PBS comes from viewers like you and from... I'm Susan Linkus of the Linkus Group, a fee-based registered investment advisor specializing in financial planning, investment management, insurance strategies, and more. LinkusGroup.com, investing for life. Clean Elections provides tools needed to help you cast an informed vote in the upcoming elections, like important deadlines, how to vote early, election day details, and nonpartisan information. Learn more at azcleanelections.gov. Coming up in the next hour of local news on Arizona PBS, on Arizona Horizon, a debate as Democratic incumbent Raul Gajalva and Republican challenger Daniel Wood address a variety of issues as they vie for the seat in Arizona's Congressional District 3. On Cronkite News, efforts to help the Navajo Nation's continued fight against COVID-19. And on Break It Down, the benefits and problems of using the word tolerance. All this and more ahead in the next hour on Arizona PBS. This hour of local news is made possible by contributions from the friends of PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this special election 2020 edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight we feature a debate between the candidates for Arizona's third congressional district, which covers all of Santa Cruz County and includes parts of Maricopa, Pima, Pinal, and Yuma counties. This debate is a joint effort between Arizona PBS, the Arizona Republic, and KJZZ Radio. And joining me to moderate is Maria Paletta from the Arizona Republic and Steve Goldstein from KJZZ Radio. This is not a formal debate. It's an open exchange of ideas, an opportunity for give and take between candidates. Interjections and even interruptions are allowed, provided that all sides get a fair shake. We'll do our best to see that that happens. Joining us now for tonight's debate in alphabetical order, Democratic incumbent Raul Grijalva and Republican challenger Daniel Wood. Each candidate will now give a one-minute opening statement with the order determined by random selection. Closing statements will be given in reverse order, and we begin with Daniel Wood. Yes, hello, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Daniel Wood. I wanted just to address you and say thank you for letting me come and, and debate with Raul Grijalva. I appreciate your time. Um, yeah, I come to you as a, as a Marine combat veteran, a former law enforcement officer, and a current uh, executive protection agent. And uh, I come running for U.S. Congress to Arizona's District 3 because I'm seeing what this country is going through right now, and I'm scared. I, I fighting in Iraq and I see these destruction in the cities and, and seeing career politicians not doing anything about it and I'm ready to say, hey, enough's enough and I want to fight for this country and I want to fight and bring on things for school choice. I want to fight for human trafficking. I want to fight for health care that's going to be affordable with pre-existing conditions and I want to fight for just the American people and let them know that there's someone here other than these career politicians that is going to work for them and fight for them. All right. And now, Congressman Grijalva, your opening statement. Thank you very much. And uh, as I ask people for, uh, uh, for their vote and to reelect me, 
uh, I, I want to thank the support that I've had in the past and thank my opponent for, uh, for being here and for sharing his time. This country, uh, as we come out of this darkness that we're in, the COVID pandemic, uh, things are going to change. And, and the status quo of how we've had things in the past are not going to apply to the recovery and the rebuilding that this nation is going to need. And I, I want to serve uh, in the leadership role that I have in Congress to make sure, to make sure that our, the people of Arizona and the people of this nation uh, are fully invested in. And that issues like jobs, issues like the clean environment, climate change, that they're all dealt with because they're all tied together. Uh, this pandemic has exposed many things and it exposed the lack of leadership at a national level and it has exposed the disparities that we have in this nation. And we need to address them. We need to address them quickly and urgently. And that's uh, the biggest chore ahead for any of us to get elected. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Congressman, we'll start with you. Um, uh uh, Mr. Wood uh, mentioned career politicians. He says he's scared about the country and the future. You've been in office since 2002. Um, is it time for Arizona to see a change in this district? Well, I think, I, I think one has to define what that change is. If that change is to uh, uh, replace me with someone that uh, has the philosophy of Donald Trump, uh, that sees uh, the pandemic as a hoax, that doesn't believe in climate science, that doesn't uh, believe in a full investment in the relief uh, that the people of this state and this country need to recover and rebuild from that pandemic, they think that's time to do that, then, then it'll happen. But if they want a level of consistency, uh, not only with this administration, but with previous administrations, to try to push an agenda that, that, that addresses real people's needs, the American people are hurting right now. Uh, they've been devastated by, by this pandemic. And I, I think the leadership that you need is one that has proven capacity, hard work. And that's what I've brought to this table time and time again. And I've been very privileged and fortunate that time and time again, the voters have allowed me uh, the good graces to continue to represent them. And Daniel, again, we're hearing that the country is in trouble. Uh, you're, you're expressing fear about the future of the country the way you see it. Is this the right time for voters to turn away from a veteran congressman? Well, I, you know, he, he addressed an issue as if uh, the COVID, it, it's a hoax, and it, it really isn't. Um, the problem with this, though, with what he's saying is, yeah, there's a seriousness going on. But we have governors and Democratic leaders who have stepped in, and, and they're taking COVID and they're taking away the rights and freedoms of American people, unconstitutional. If you saw in Pennsylvania, the judge came out and showed that it was unconstitutional for these non-essential businesses to be closed down, all right? And that's what's happened. That's what's happened. That's what these Democratic career politicians, and even some rhinos, I call it that way too, have done. They've closed down our our businesses and we're losing and and people are without jobs they're not being able to feed their families so uh, you know what i think it's a matter of how you look at it and obviously grahava is grahava is not looking at it like it should be we need to open back up we need to provide the jobs back to the people because they're losing them you know i've talked to many people as i've campaigned and they're worried about their they're worried about their well-being and their family's well-being because their jobs they can't go to work our, our First Amendment rights have been taken away. You look at, yeah, you look well, at I, church. We, we closed got, down our churches. We, we need to get a yes, response sir. from the Congressman Grijalva on that. I, I, let's just for a second stop and, and, and think of one of the biggest mistruths, lies that, that has occurred. A month and a half, two, almost two months before the pandemic became the item that the country had to respond to, that Congress had to respond to, the President of the United States was briefed on it. He said in an interview that it was true, that it was deadly, that it was going to spread, that it was going to have economic devastation to this country. And for two months, nothing was done. He definitely closed down that the is, whole United that, States. That is exactly what we're talking about in this instance. We've had, uh, we've had an administration that for three years has verified 20,000 20, lies. And this is the big lie in which the American people were lied to. You know, I... I, I, I I think that, that a response, an aggressive response against that kind of behavior on the part of the President of the United States is appropriate, and I've taken that kind of response. So I'd like to say, you know what, 
Obviously, he wants to tie me with the president, which I, 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 I support the president. I do. But if I run for Congress, I also am going to stand up for things that, that the, if my district says that the president is going beyond, above and beyond what they're you know, asking for, if he's doing something that they don't want him to do, I will stand up for that, okay? Mr. Wood, let's, let's stick with the pandemic for a second okay. as far as COVID goes. What would you have liked to have seen the president do overall? There are some who said as, he, he went too far. Some said he didn't go far okay. enough. What would have been the, the happy medium? As someone... Well, I'm hazmat operator certified. I'm also, I've worked many emergency scenes, okay? You take a pandemic, all right? Let's take a, a, a wreck and say, I get on scene, it's chaotic, all right? President had to deal with something that was chaotic. What he did is he took it step by step. Same thing I had to do when I came to a traffic scene where someone was mangled. And, and, and so I had to take it step by step. And that's what the president did. He took it step by step. He went off the advice of his advisors. I can't I can't fault him for that. You're taking a crazy scene that's happened in America. That's it's fear, it's chaotic, and he took it and he came with a calmness about it. And so I would say that he did the best he could with the limited resources he could do because of previous administrations, because of previous politicians, and, and leaving us with limited resources. And he took it and he ran with it, and he gave us companies that made you know, the, uh, breath, the breath machines and, and, and so on. So I would say he did a pretty good job but, as someone who has dealt with chaotic scenes and, 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 and such. I mean, you do your best, you take a chaotic scene and you move forward. I'll tell you the congressman respond to this. Congressman, what would have been that, that right swat, that sweet swat? That sweet I, 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 evoking the, uh, uh, the power that he has to make industries and across this country und, uh, under the act uh, to respond by doing the ventilators, the protection uh, masks, yeah, and, and everything that. else that was necessary. Moving quickly, moving quickly to, uh, to do the second relief package that we're now lacking. People are unemployed. Unemployed has run out. Evictions are increasing. That's the hurt that's going on. And, you know, the, the, the president's response to it was to politicize CDC, to politicize FDA, and, and make it and, and try to downplay the seriousness of what we're doing. What about seven million people have been infected? Seven million. We're approaching 210,000 people have died in this country. Five to almost 6,000 in Arizona and, and half a million infected in Arizona. Those are serious numbers that we cannot ignore. Mr. Wood, was the president so consistent what did, enough? Didn't CDC just come out recently and said it was only 9,000 that, that died from it? I mean, so I, I mean, I, I'm confused because we got CDC comes out with these numbers and it's changing constantly. It's either high, it's low, it depends on where it's coming from. So, I mean, I'm not sure if Mr. Congressman here is, uh, is right about what he's saying or are, is he are, be are, if he's trying to push fear. Are I mean, you saying 9,000 people in the United States have died from COVID-19? Well, that's what I'm confused about. I mean, I go and research and CDC just came back and said the numbers weren't as, as far as the numbers of death of COVID itself weren't as high. What it said was is actually a majority of those, 90 plus percent of those were actually deaths of other illnesses, but they did have COVID, but it was it contributed to the other illnesses. So I'm I'm not sure if what he's saying is true or not. But again, I'm going off of what CDC has put out. And then same thing if you look at Maricopa County when our, our folks came out and they said that there was some misrepresentation of COVID deaths also. I asked, absolutely believe those figures, the figures that I said. Absolutely believe them. And, and uh, we, the, what's happened in the, in the Navajo Nation and other uh, tribal lands, what's happened in poor communities where that disparity is even higher, I absolutely believe that. And, and that's why I said that you can't respond to status quo. And what are we going to do, debate for the next two years whether the figures are right or not? The figures are right. And we have to at some point accept science and empirical fact as being the guide to us responding to this pandemic and not let politics influence how we respond to it. We're going to shift gears a little bit to immigration now. Obviously, Congressional District 3 includes some border cities, so it's an important issue there. Yep. Uh, given the pandemic, federal officials have stopped processing asylum claims for asylum seekers. They've halted all related hearings. That means thousands of asylum seekers are essentially in limbo at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, Congressman, how should the U.S. approach resuming asylum claims processing? You know, I, I, I really believe that once we get off of, of, of making immigration and the borderlands and the border itself, uh, the, the highly politicized 
us versus them issue that 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 it's been converted to by, by by this administration that we can start looking at solutions the american people want us to codify daca into law and protect those young people long term the american people on all opinion polls feel that there needs to be a system of asylum and refugee seekers where credible fear is proven that that process go back into effect and we start processing those security has to be part of it no question about it, but for us to make this issue and continue to escalate it robs us of the opportunity to have a solution around immigration reform. It's tough enough. We can all agree on, on whatever side of the spectrum politically that the system is broken. The issue now is how do you solve it? Do you perpetuate this issue and continue to make it a, the, the cudgel that you're using to get reelected as president, or do you begin to now look at how you begin to put solutions together, either in a comprehensive way or in a pragmatic, in incremental way. Mr. Wood, if you could respond, what are your thoughts on uh, the situation with asylum seekers? Should there be a path forward there? Thoughts on dreamers? I would like to remind Grijalva, he's been in for 18 years. He's done nothing. Our president's only been in for four years. What have you done before that? That's my question. You know. You're talking about this. We need more judges. We need these things. You know, it, I, I did some research on this, and it seems like what happens is, is a lot of these asylum seekers get caught up. They get caught up in all in the court system. Then they get pushed to the Ninth Circuit, and, and so on. So it's and it's due to just so much regulations on this that it needs to be cleaned up. All right. We look at we look at the issue of the, you know COVID. You're talking about you're talking about because of COVID. Well, we've got to protect our nation first because those coming over borders might have COVID. So we're, that's why we've got to shut down now. It makes perfect sense. We want to protect our nation. You know, going back again, I'd like to say that I mean, a congressman's been in for 18 years. You had eight years of Obama. Eight years of Obama. You had a, a Democratic president and you did nothing to fix this. You've got poor ports. You've got human and drug trafficking that's a billion dollar industry, each one of them a billion dollar industry. Human trafficking itself is a $36 billion roughly. And so we, we, we got to ask ourselves, why are we allowing the border to be open, wide open for these things, which just destroys our communities? Let's let the congressman respond. Under Obama, we had the executive order on DACA because the Republican-controlled Congress would not pass any legislation dealing with the DREAM Act or any immigration legislation. First thing Trump did, one of the first things he did was undo that executive order and take it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court verify, validated that that order was okay, and, and we continued to proceed. That was the first act. The second act and the third act has been to raise the issue uh, make the border wall central to any immigration reform. Uh, Mexico's not paying for it. 450 miles uh, might be built uh, before this term is up, and yet we continue to talk about the wall as the panacea to solve this problem. It's not the panacea. And if anything has occurred, if anything has occurred, it has been to escalate this issue and to introduce all kinds of other factors, including race into this issue, which it shouldn't have been there in the beginning. But yes. Where was the race at? I want, I mean, because it seems like the Democratic Party is constantly race, 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 but when I go door to door, I mean, I'm, I'm going to a 65% Hispanic community and I'm a white man, okay? But yet they take me in as an American, well, that's you know, good. as black, so on. It seems like the Democratic Party is constantly pushing race and yet we end up with places like Antifa destroying our cities because y'all will not denounce Antifa. And you won't denounce the Proud Boys. I, I, the, I the denounce Proud the Boys? violence. No, I will. I, I will. denounce the violence. No, I I, any violence I would denounce. I'm not, I don't even I, know who the Proud Boys is. I'm sorry. And 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 every action that has occurred, I, I denounce have you all not, violence. Have you, are you going to denounce Antifa? I have, I've denounced all the violence associated with but people. But yet you continue I to call I call them peaceful. opportunists taking an issue that was not the issue. Opportunists. Yeah. Stealing our, our stealing our our clothes, stealing our stuff, destroying our windows, breaking our buildings, burning them. People in the streets getting kicked in the face, knocked out cold, and you call that opportunist? I, really? I said they were opportunists on an issue. No, I, I'm confused now because you just well, sit there and I, said it was an opportune time for them. I think the confusion began earlier than that. But okay. anyway, I... Uh, I okay, I, 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 okay. Yeah, let's, let, let's, let's try to move on here. Uh, Daniel Wood, um, obviously you're a supporter of the president. You've said as much uh, in this debate. Um, he has said uh, he's called the COVID-19, the pandemic, a hoax. 
He said at one point it would magically disappear. He said at one point it would be gone by summer. We've had numerous reports that the president called military people suckers and losers. And now we're finding out that he paid less in income tax than no doubt you, me, and everyone on this stage paid last year. Do you still support the president? I support the president because I don't trust what the news is saying. You don't trust any of those reports? I don't trust mainstream media whatsoever. When he said it was Nor a hoax, it was Nor does the people on, trust it was, mainstream media. When he said it was a hoax, Are you it kidding? was reported. I mean, the president's done more than ever as far as it goes. He's done more for the veterans than anybody. I have the choice as a veteran. I can go and choose where I go to the, where go, go get seen, all right? Who, that didn't happen before. Matter of fact, before I did move here, I, I, had, I had VA in Georgia. Man, I get seen, it was good VA, but then I come to VA here and it's unbelievable. It didn't change until the president made sure that those who weren't doing their job could get fired. And once they got fired, then things improved. Then he gave me choice because he passed an order so I can have the choice to go see a doctor anywhere else if I couldn't get seen. So, so I'm he just called, curious. When he called Senator McCain a loser and he likes his heroes, I, not Cap. I, I don't support Senator McCain. He was, he was so a, he you was a believe senator that Senator McCain's long, a loser? And yet Phoenix had Do you the believe Senator had. McCain's a loser? Huh? Do you think Senator McCain was a loser? No, I don't think so. He was a senator who had been in for a long time. So you disagree time, with I the don't president support, on that? I don't support the senator at all. So you, dis you disagree with the president on that? I do. I okay. do. Right. I do. Uh, the Congressman, uh, President Trump said he would go to Washington and shake things up. He's shaking things up. He's done what he said he would do. Yeah, and, and, and draining the sewer has created a cesspool. Uh, and uh, the, the conflicts of interest that... Inspector General reports that come out consistently uh, about the political appointments, whether it is in the Bureau of Land Management, whether it's an EPA, the, 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 uh, the deregulation of almost 100 regulations meant to protect the public health of the American people were rolled back to the benefit of petrol industry and to the benefit of extraction industry. That's just in the area that I work in. And the list goes on and on. And the downsizing and minimizing of science and empirical facts in the decision making by an administration, I think, is the most hurtful. The next thing we can remember, the, the abject threat, I think, in this election and leading up to it, to our democracy as a whole. The, the whole idea that he uses the bully pulpit to question the validity of people voting by mail, to question the validity of voting, period, and to threaten that if I don't think it, I lost fairly, I'm not going to leave. I mean, those are all, I think, authoritarian and yeah, quite like dangerous attitudes uh, that this president has okay. brought to this White House and uh, ma marching us toward two Americas, us versus them. There's only one us. Okay. It's Fine. only us in this country. It's not us versus them. Thank you. Mr. Wood, let's start with the economy. Let's go back to that. You talked about how there are issues with COVID, whether you, people agree with how the president handled it or not. We're in a situation, as Congressman Grijalva said in his opening statement, we're going to have to rebuild, considering where we're at right now. And there are some cities reopening, some states reopening, others wondering if they're going to have to close up again. Where are you in terms of what the direction is to get the economy back on track? Um, you know, we definitely got to open back up. You see Florida opening up, I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's brought in back businesses. People are ready. They're getting out there. They're working. We need to do the same thing here. We need to cut regulations for sure. If you walk and you go down to Tucson, Tucson and Yuma, it's just it, it's poverty. It's poverty. All right. And so we've got to do something to change that. And when I've gone around, I've talked to them and, and the business owners are telling me it's the regulations that are killing them. So we need to cut the regulations. I'd also like to do something where we get in and we can do something as far as payroll taxes. Let's put a break on payroll taxes at least till two, uh, 2021. And, and that would be a, a boost for the economy. I know for me, a paycheck to paycheck type of guy, it would help me tremendously. You know, continue with the child tax credits, too. We'll continue with those for right now. And those are some of the things I think would be a, a benefit to get us back up and going, at least until, until we get into 2021 and get out of 2020. Congressman, where does this rebuilding of the economy go right now? Yeah, I, I, I think we're going to have to. Either we do it during lame duck or we do it in January when hopefully there's a more receptive administration. Health care continues to be the issue. Testing, tracing and the equipment and supporting small businesses with, uh, with extending the PPP for them. Second of all, budget stabilization for cities, counties, and states needed. 
And the third thing is that make sure that we have the funding for our schools so they can open and our children can truly be in that in-classroom experience that is so vital to them. This requires an investment on the part of the American people, Congress, and the administration. It, saving lives costs money, and if we want to avoid that question, then we continue to talk around it and not deal with it. But we have to make an investment, and it has to be a relief package that takes us to stabilization, and from stabilization we begin to build. I like right. the investment that Very he's quickly, talking please. about. Very quickly. Uh, the investment with school choice would be nice, you know, given scholarship programs for transportation for those who can't afford it, scholarship programs for those with, uh, my son's got Asperger's high in functioning, so it would have been nice to go to a special school. I hope my wife homeschools, and to have those scholarships would have been nice. Maybe maybe cut uh, business taxes, and then they do they, they put into these scholarship programs. Oh. That would be nice. We, okay, gentlemen, we have to stop it right there. Time now for closing statements. And going in reverse order of our opening remarks, we start with Congressman Raul Grijalva. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. And, uh, uh, there's a lot at stake in this election. Everybody knows that. And, and, and I said something right now. that I, I think we can't continue to march to two Americas. We can't continue to have the division. We can't continue to have uh, the threat to our de democratic institutions. We need to stabilize and repair the damage that's been done. And I want that opportunity. I want that opportunity not only to look at, at the immediate, but look down the road toward the future. And... Uh, I think I've shown my capacity. I think I've shown that I work hard, and, I, and, and the voters have been kind to me. And I would like to continue uh, in the job that I have now in this very critical and important period, uh, not because I've been there 18 years, because I'm the one that can do the job. Thank Cong you. Congressman, thank you very much. And now a closing statement from Daniel Wood. So I just want to thank you. Uh, Congressman's done a lot, but he's been in, and... His, his choices have caused nothing but poverty for this, for this district, open borders, which has allowed human trafficking, drug trafficking. It's just been not, it's not been good for, this, for our country. And I'm here to make that difference. I'm here to come to you as a, as a former combat Marine and, and law enforcement officer and fight for you and fight for the people, fight for the schools. And I'm, I just want to let you know that, hey, God bless America. That is it for now. Thank you so much for joining us on this election 2020 debate for Arizona's Congressional District 3. Join us next week as we moderate debates between candidates for Congressional Districts 1 and 8, also the candidates for Senate and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. And Wednesday, join me for a debate between the candidates for the Corporation Commission. The special one-hour debate is sponsored by the Citizens for Clean Elections Commission. Good night. Coming up on Cronkite News, hundreds have died from COVID-19 on the night.